Let's take our Bibles and turn over to the book of John. The book of John, chapter number 16. The book of John, chapter number 16. And I want to continue tonight on this topic, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God lives inside us. He is God. We look at uh, Acts 10, 43, how the, when Cornelius believed, the Holy Spirit of God came upon him. And in uh, Romans 8, the Bible says that if you don't have the Spirit of God, you're none of His. You have to have the Holy Spirit of God in you to be saved. So uh, some people teach, well, once you get saved, you need, you need to pray that the Holy Spirit will come in. Folks, the moment you believe on Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit of God moves in. 100% of the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. 100%. The same amount lives in us as the Apostle Paul. The same amount lives in us as the Apostle Peter. And that He is in us in His fullness. Now the question is, how much of us does He have? That's the question. How yielded are we to the Holy Spirit of God? And 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16, the Bible says, the temple of the Holy Spirit, whose temple ye are. And 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says, What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For you're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And then Ephesians 1 tells us that we were sealed by that Holy Spirit of promise the moment we believed on Jesus Christ. So the Holy Spirit of God lives inside of us. And we turn to John 14. We just heard the girls quote John 14, 1 through 6. Jesus was telling his disciples, he said, I'm getting ready to go away. And that put sorrow in their hearts. He said, but listen, it's good for you that I go away. Why? Because I'm going to send you the Comforter. I love that name for the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus said about the Holy Spirit. He is the Comforter. We saw this morning through several passages of Scripture. Number one, that He is our Comforter. He abides with us forever. He teaches us through God's Word. He reminds us of God's Word. He gives us peace. He testifies of Jesus and He urges us to testify of Jesus. It's the Holy Spirit in us that makes us soul winners. It's the Holy Spirit in us that motivates us to tell others about Jesus Christ. By the way, this week, if we'll be sensitive to the Holy Spirit of God, if we'll listen, He will talk to our hearts. He will put someone, somewhere, on your heart. Uh, I, I, I didn't take time, but I want to tell this story very quickly. I was out on a bus route in PRP, out where Nathan lives now, out on Greenwood Road. And uh, we, we were in a hurry. I can't even remember what we were doing that Saturday afternoon. But we had to do something back at church. And uh, I, I know I've told this story before, but there was a fellow leaning against a trailer. And the Holy Spirit, and it's the Holy Spirit. When this happens, it's the Holy Spirit. Mo moved my heart. You need to go talk to that fellow right there. How many of you have ever had that happen before? You know without a doubt. I mean, it's, it's just as loud as if somebody shouted in your ear. But it's a shout in your heart. It's the Holy Spirit. Saying, hey, you need to do this. And he, mo he urged me, you need to go speak to that man. So the man's leaning against a trailer. There's some items in the trailer. And I went up and said, introduce myself, introduce David. And I uh, said, I have a bus that comes through here, picks up folks for church. And I wonder, do you have a church? And uh, do you know for sure when you die you're going to heaven? He said, oh yeah, I know, I'm saved. I've trusted Jesus. And I thought, well, Lord, why did you send me here? I said, so are you moving in? He said, no, we're moving my brother out. He said, my brother just discovered that he has stage 4 cancer. I said, well, this must be why God wants me here. I said, well, sir, can I ask you a question? Is your brother saved? Is he 100% sure when he dies he's going to heaven? He goes, yeah, I think he's saved. No sooner had he said that. Then this lady comes out of those apartments. I believe it's Lower Hunters. Uh, right there off of uh, 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 Greenbelt. And she had a beer in one hand and a cigarette in the other. And she said, oh, no. And I'm not going to yell as loud as she did. But she said, oh, no, so-and-so. He's not saved. Just because so-and-so said he's saved doesn't mean he's saved. I went, wow. And then she said this to me. She said, you need to go up there right now. She said, you need to go up there right now. Because his family is Catholic. And they're here helping move some items. In about an hour and a half, they're going to be up there and they will not let you talk to them if you wait until then. Do you think that was the Lord? Amen. It was absolutely the Lord. It was the Holy Spirit of God 
impressing my heart, saying, hey, you need to go talk to this man. And, and he does that all the time. And occasionally, though, he, he pulls back the curtain of his providence and of his sovereignty, and he shows us what he knows. Yeah. Now, we don't see it most of the time. Most of the time, we just have to decide whether we're going to be obedient or not. We just have to decide whether we're going to listen and give out that track or listen and speak to that person about their soul. Well, I said, Lord, this, this is the Macedonian call. Here we go. We left the bus track. We drove to Norton Pavilion, downtown Norton Pavilion, and the old Methodist hospital. Walked into the hospice. I can't remember if it was hospice or hospice at the time. Walked into the unit, and there, there was Stephen Fox. Long, lanky man. You could tell cancer just emaciated his body. Just thin but we went through the gospel and he was just ready to be saved. Amen. I went back to try to follow up with him and within days he was in heaven. How did that happen? That, that happened. How is it that he got saved? He got saved because the Holy Spirit, I happened to be the person right there that the Holy Spirit was impressing on my heart, go talk to that man. There's somebody, you're going to come across their path this week. Maybe it's at your workplace. Maybe it's your neighbor. Maybe it's a relative. And the Holy Spirit is going to knock on your heart's door. And if you're listening, if you're listening to that still small voice, He'll knock on your heart's door. The Holy Spirit's job is to testify of Jesus, but because He lives in you, He's going to urge you to also testify of Jesus to somebody. Amen. Now, occasionally, He'll show you what He knows. But usually He doesn't. Usually you just have to do it by obedience and leave the rest up to Him. So I want to encourage you this week, as you go out, Listen to those urgings. Listen to that, that, uh, that Holy Spirit's voice and yield to Him. He urges us to testify of Jesus. And then we finished on this this morning. He convicts and convinces men of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. He is a voice. He is a voice that continually works in the hearts of men and women, boys and girls. When you give out a gospel tract... The Holy Spirit is still there knocking on that heart's door. When you speak to someone about their soul, they may rebuff you initially, but they're still uh, the Holy Spirit is still there when you leave. He's still there working on that heart, and He is the one who convicts people and convinces people that they need a Savior. By the way, that's why every Christian can be and should be a soul winner. Because it's not based on how well you can talk. It's not based on how well you can, you can convince anybody. You don't argue anybody into heaven. You don't debate anybody into heaven. You simply are the one carrying the truth. You're the one who presents the truth, who offers the truth, and the Holy Spirit of God is the one who does the convincing and the convicting. So every one of us can be soul winners and should be soul winners. Amen. Let me say tonight, I want to look at these points now tonight about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Number 9, John 16, look at verse number 12. After he said that when he, the comforters, come, he'll reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, of judgment. Then he said, verse 12, he said, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Now, in, in the immediate situation, who was he talking to here? He was talking to the apostle. He was talking to men who he would use to pen down the word of God. And he said to them, he said, I have a lot of things I need to say to you, but you can't bear them now. You, you, you can't handle them right now. They couldn't even handle the fact that he was going to the cross. He tried to tell them that. He tried to tell them he was going to die, be buried, and rise again. And they, and they said, no, Lord. Peter said, no, you're here to be a king. And he said, get thee behind me, Satan. Thou savest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. And he's saying to the apostles, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come. I want you to notice how many times he's called the comforter and he's called the spirit of truth. When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And, don't miss this. And He will show you things to come. He's going to reveal to you some things that are going to happen in the future. Well, who was standing there? John the Revelator. He said He's going to show you some things to come. Things you can't handle right now, but you will be able to. He's going to show you some things to come. Get your pencil ready. Get your pen ready. Uh, get your tablet ready. You're going to pen these things down, and it's going to be uh, my eternal word. Verse 
14. He, the Holy Spirit, shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. He's going to reveal it unto you. Verse 15. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. Lord, speak to our hearts tonight again. Help us to understand what a ministry, Holy Spirit, you have in our lives. We literally are your temple. You live inside of us. Everywhere we go, you go. Thank you for your ministry. Help us to understand it more fully tonight and help us to yield more fully to you tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Number nine, the Holy Spirit revealed the truth to the apostles and He reveals it to all believers. He illuminates the Word of God in us. Uh, as you read through the Word of God, now listen, there is no new revelation. We don't need a new revelation, right. which is why uh, the tongues movement it is, is so uh, is, is such apostasy. It's such uh, false right. doctrine. We don't need right. a new uh, word from God. Amen. Uh, when I was a teenager, I went with some neighbors to a, an Assembly of God church, and it was about five thousand strong. It was a gigantic church, and uh, I was sitting up. I, I believe I was in the balcony, if I remember. In fact, I had to be because I remember <laughs> the view of the orchestra, and. Uh, they were having what they call, the, I guess, their, their worship time. They kind of dimmed the lights real low, you know. And all of a sudden, this tuba player just started playing. I and mean, it wasn't any song. There was no melody line at all. It was just bum, 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 bam. I mean, just, just strange notes just coming out. And I looked down, and I recognized the tuba player. He was a fellow who used to play tuba at the GARB church I grew up in. I went, that's Brian. I, I recognize Brian. And he's up there just playing notes. And all of a sudden, a lady stood up in the crowd. And she was going to interpret what the tuba said. My children, I'm with you, and I will strengthen you. I said, wait a minute, I didn't need the tuba to tell me that. I've got God's Word to tell me that. Somebody else stood up and said, I shall have a Honda Honda Kawasaki something. I don't remember what all they said, but somebody else stood up and interpreted it. Folks, that, that's, that's not tongues. That's baloney, okay? Exactly right. Tongues, is, tongues is, were literal languages. Right. And if you look at Acts chapter 2, God used those tongues, that language, to get the gospel around the world. But what did He say? He said, tongues shall cease. Right. We don't need further revelation. We have complete revelation right, right here. Right. But what did the Holy Spirit say to the men that He was going to move, to the men He was going to use to pen down His Word? He said, there's things you can't handle right now. You can't bear them now, but I'll tell you later. I'll tell you, and I'm going to show you things to come. With that in mind, look over at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. This passage of Scripture often gets applied to speak of heaven. And certainly you can apply it that way. It's okay. I don't think God's upset if we use it as an illustration uh, to say, I have not seen, neither uh, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love Him. 1 Corinthians 2 9. You know, I don't think God gets upset if we say, Heaven's so wonderful that you just you can't even imagine all the beauty that's there. I, I think that's true. If you look at Revelation, uh, we, can, we can kind of see. Paul said, I see through a glass darkly. I kind of see what's on the other side. But what this passage is talking about in the context, it's talking about the Word of God. Because notice what he says, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. He says, as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man. By the way, that tells you the Word of God didn't come from the heart of man. Right. Man didn't make up this book. Man right. didn't write this book. It, he, man didn't even think of the things that God put in this book. Right. Neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love Him. Don't miss this. But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. Amen. Remember what He said to the apostles? He said, I'm going to show you things to come. I'm going to reveal some things to you. And for us, we have the perfect Word of God. We need to be reading it. We need to be memorizing it. We need to be studying it and letting the Holy Spirit illuminate the Word for us. Notice, God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him, even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Every Amen. promise in the book is mine. Every Amen. chapter, every verse, every line, freely given to us. Good. 
2 Peter 1, 3 and 4 says, According as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Everything we need for life and godliness is in this book. Everything we need. And notice, he says, these are things freely given to us of God. Verse 13, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. Well, where does the Holy Ghost give us the word? Right here in the Bible. Notice what he says, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man... Receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. The lost man, the carnal man, the, the old nature rather, doesn't receive the things of the Spirit of God. Right. By the way, that's why when you're out soul winning, when you're trying to tell somebody about Jesus, don't forget this. The greatest goal is to get to the gospel. Amen. Why? Because somebody who's lost can't possibly understand why you believe what you believe and how why you live the way you live when they're lost. Right. The first thing they need is salvation. So when somebody tries to argue with you about some point, or, or why do you all go to church this many times a week, or why don't you do this, or why do you do that, you're wasting your time if you try to argue. Right. The best thing you can do is get them to, get them to Jesus Christ. Get them to the gospel. Right. Why? Because the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. When the Holy Spirit of God moves in, He illuminates the Word of God. Now, let me say this. Even as a Christian with the Holy Spirit living in your heart, you're not going to just understand the Word of God because you sleep on it like a pillow every night. Right. You're not going to understand the Word of God by osmosis where the words just leak out of the book and go into your head. It's not going to happen that way. You still have to study to show yourself approved unto God. You still have to meditate upon the Word of God. But notice... The Holy Spirit revealed the truth to the apostles and to all believers. We have a perfect, complete revelation. Number 10, I want you to see this. The Holy Spirit gives life. Look at Romans 8. He gives life to our glorified bodies. He gives life to our glorified bodies. Oh, uh, we Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. But we will, the Bible says, Romans chapter 8, with our new bodies, our glorified bodies, that Spirit will be in us, giving us life. The Bible says, Romans chapter 8, verse 9, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. This body is going to die. This body will decay, but not the new body. Amen. And notice, the Holy Spirit who is with us forever will be in that new body. Notice what he says. If Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. He, the Holy Spirit, gives life. To our glorified bodies. He, our, our glorified bodies will run on the Spirit of God. That's what they'll run on. Number, uh, number next, I want you to see, look at verse 12. Number, number uh, 11, He leads us to a spiritual life of victory over the flesh. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He leads us to victory over the flesh. Look at verse number 12. The Bible says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors. Because the Spirit lives in us, because He's going to quicken our mortal bodies that are destroyed by sin... Notice, therefore we are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify, what does that mean? Put to death. Amen. Mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. God wants us dying daily. Paul said, I die daily. Let's look at it again at what Galatians 6 has to say. Galatians chapter 6. Look at verse number 7. Galatians 6, verse number 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, speaking of a farmer planting seed, that kind of sowing, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. So we reap what we sow. We reap more than we sow, and we reap after we sow. Now look at verse, uh, verse 8. For he that soweth to his flesh, he that sows seeds of the flesh, feeds the flesh, shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit 
shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap, if, here's the key, if we faint not. You know, here, here's the key. When you get saved, I, there's so many brand new Christians, they'll say, Pastor, now that I'm saved, my life's harder than it's ever been. Well, there's a reason for that. The reason for that is, before you were saved, you were asleep in the devil's lap and you were headed straight for hell and he didn't want to wake you up. But once you got saved, you lined up against the devil. You lined up against him. And what he would love for your life, he can't have your soul once you're saved, but what he can take is your testimony. He can take your influence for God. He just wants to get you out of the battle. He just wants whatever it takes, whether it's discouragement or flesh, lust or greed or envy or pride or arrogance, it doesn't matter. Whatever he can use to get you out of the battle makes him happy. He just wants to take your testimony. And so uh, the key is when you're saved, you're going to keep having seeds uh, sprouting up from things you planted in the past. You know, I was out in the, I was out in, uh, the inner city on a bus route in Smoketown. And right in the middle of a sidewalk, you know what I saw coming up through that sidewalk? A corn stalk. I mean, I, I grew up in corn, you know, I grew up in the farm country. I was surrounded by corn stalks, planted on purpose. But here I was in the city. Smoke down, and here's a corn stalk coming up out of the sidewalk. You know, that's kind of the way uh, life is when, when you maybe had a past before you were saved. You know what happens? Even when you want to serve the Lord, you're going to have occasionally one of those stalks pop up again. Yeah. And you know what you have to do? You have to think about the harvest you want to have in the future. That's why it says, Galatians 6, be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth the Spirit, Amen. coming to church, reading your Bible, living a holy life, soul winning, giving, uh, uh, helping others, whatever the, whatever the Holy Spirit's work is doing in your heart, he that soweth the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing. Have you ever gotten tired in well-doing? Man, man I, I, I'm trying to do what's right, but I just keep having these things pop up in my life again. Let us not be weary in well-doing. Why? For in due season, just like those seeds from the past sprout up here and there, plant the seeds today for the harvest you want in the future. Because in due season, Amen. we shall reap the harvest we want to have. If we faint not. So the Holy Spirit teaches us not only to uh, that, that He is going to comfort us, but He also teaches us to live a life of spiritual victory over the flesh. He teaches us how to crucify the flesh. He teaches us how to know that we're buried with Christ and risen with Him and how to reckon ourselves dead indeed unto sin and to yield ourselves to God. That's what the Holy Spirit's teaching us. So here's the question. Which, which one do you feed the most? The flesh or the spirit? You know the story of the missionary. The, the Indian chief that got saved. And he was trying to tell the missionary what was going on in his heart. He said, there's a black dog fighting and a white dog fighting. And the missionary said, well, which one wins? He said, the one I feed the most. Yeah. Which one do you feed the most? If you feed the flesh, it'll corrupt you. Even as a Christian, it'll corrupt you. But if you feed the spirit... That will bring forth life everlasting. You'll, you'll make a difference for a whole lot of souls. You'll make a difference in your own family. You'll make a difference in your own community. Let us not be weary in well-doing. Don't get tired of it. For in due season, we shall reap if we faint not. Keep planting those right seeds. The Holy Spirit leads us to a spiritual life of victory. What else is His ministry in our lives? Look back at Romans 8 again. Romans 8, verse 14, I love this. The Holy Spirit is the one who gives us the assurance of our salvation. Look at Romans 8, verse 14. The Bible says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. If you're saved, if you believe on Jesus Christ, who is it causing you to fear again and again? It's not the Holy Spirit. It's not. That's why the Bible says in Ephesians 6, take, put on the helmet of salvation. Does that just mean get saved? Well, it means get saved. But it also means know you're saved. Have the assurance. 
And who should give you that assurance? Who's the only one who can give you that assurance? The Holy Spirit. Amen. And how does He give you that assurance? Through the Word of God. Amen. When you lead somebody to Christ, whether it be your own child or an adult or anyone else, don't tell them they're saved. Don't tell them. Don't say, now you're saved. I'll tell you what you should do instead. You should take the Word of God again. And show them what the Word of God says. And let them tell you whether or not they're saved. Not based on how they feel. Now it's good to feel good when you get saved. That's always nice. But, but I, I don't like to ask people, how do you feel? Because guess what? Some days I know I'm saved, but I don't feel good. I know I ought to go to church. I don't feel like saved. You're the pastor. Yeah, there's days I'm tired. Don't feel like it. Yeah. There's days I don't feel like reading the Bible. Yeah. Amen. There's days I don't feel like winning souls. There's days it comes soul winning time. And I'd rather just sit there and go, I don't know. By the way, in soul winning, that's the greatest battle. Just get out there and start. You get out there and start, and you'll feel like being out there. But how, how do you give people the assurance? You don't give it to them. The Holy Spirit does. You know, if they, if they believe on Jesus Christ, go back to the Scripture. Show them. Romans 10, 13. It says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Based on God's Word. Did you call on Jesus Christ to save you? Then based on God's Word, are you saved or lost? Look at 1 John 5, 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. Have you believed on Jesus as your Savior? These things have I written unto you. What? That ye might know that ye have eternal life. Show them the Word of God. The Holy Spirit is the one who gives us assurance. Notice verse 14 again. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, Daddy, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the, son, the children of God. And if children, then heirs, Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. He gives us the assurance of our salvation. Next, He helps us endure suffering. He helps us endure suffering. This life is not our, this world's not our own. We are called to follow the footsteps of Christ. And if you read that verse in context, it's talking about suffering. You know, there's much fruit that comes in the life of a Christian through difficulty, there's much fruit that comes through a valley. Through a trial, through a tribulation, all pain in a Christian's life does have a purpose. All problems do have a purpose. Nothing comes to your life that doesn't first pass through the hands of a loving God. Amen. And the Holy Spirit uses difficulty to strengthen us so we can be a greater blessing to others. And, and it will be a greater blessing to us as well. But we have to learn patience through that tribulation. I want you to see what it says. Romans 8, the Holy Spirit... Helps us to endure our sufferings. Look at verse 17. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. You know what he's saying? In eternity, you've got it made. You've got it made. Right. I, I mean, we're joint heirs with Christ. Amen. That literally means whatever Christ gets, we get. Amen. Is that amazing or what? what, what joint heirs. Not second place. Joint heirs. Wow. wow. We're joint heirs with Christ. So, really, I mean, we can just get through this little time in this world. We've got it made out there. Amen. So, what's the Holy Spirit's job here? To help us endure. Amen. To comfort us. To help us keep the proper perspective. Mm -hmm. To help us stay focused on stuff that really matters. Yeah. You know, there's tribulation in this world. Notice what he says, Romans 8, verse 17, joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that way we may be also glorified together, for I reckon, I like those words. I usually hear those in the country, I reckon, I reckon. What that means, it means I've, I've, I've taken an estimation of this situation and I think this is how it is. I reckon, I've, I've, I've done the math on both sides and it, it figures out pretty good for us. <laughs> you know, a little trouble here. Join heirs with Christ there. Amen. I reckon we've got made. Yeah. I reckon that the sufferings of this present time 
are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. God didn't say He would deliver you from trouble. He said He'd be with you through the trouble. He said He'd go with you through the Red Sea. He said He'd go with you through the storm. He didn't promise you there'd be no storms. As a matter of fact, it's quite the opposite. For a child of God, there are storms, there are troubles, there are tribulations. But yield to the Holy Spirit of God. He's in you for a purpose. He's comforting you. He's helping you. And He will help you to endure the suffering. He will. He'll help you. And last of all, I want to see this. And this is how I believe above all He helps us endure suffering. Look at Romans 8 verse 26. What does He do? He in, intercedes for us according to the perfect will of God. Can I ask you a question? Do you know the perfect will of God for yourself in every twist and turn of your life? I mean, do you know how your life should be ordered in every single turn of your life? No. Nobody does. Now, there's some big things we know. Yeah, that's the will of God. Our sanctification, that's the will of God. That people be saved, that's the will of God. We know that. There's a lot of things we don't know. There's a lot of things we couldn't even pretend to understand. I know that it is not in man to direct his steps. It's not. So what do we need? We need a comforter. Amen. We need somebody praying for us who gets it right every time. You know, sometimes folks will ask me to pray, and you've had this, and we ask you to pray about a situation, and they'll say, pray for this. And they have a specific thing. And, and sometimes if I believe that's God's will, I'll pray for that. But many times I don't know if that's exactly God's will. So you know what I'll say? I'm going to pray that God's will be done. And pastor, that's a cop out. No, that's the right way to pray. And God... You work out your will. Why? Because His will and His plan is a whole lot better than mine. Amen. And it's a whole lot better than any of ours. He sees the beginning and the end. He sees it all. Look at Romans 8.26. The Bible says, Likewise also, the Spirit, likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. To them who are the called according to His purpose. Even those bitter moments of life, even those difficult moments, even the things that I wouldn't choose, even the storms I don't want to be a part of, even the valleys I don't want to walk through, all things, Amen. all things. Why? Because there's a Holy Spirit of God in us, interceding for us. And what is God's goal ultimately for all of us? Where are we headed? Where are we predestined to go? Look at verse 29. This is... This is where predestination is in the Bible. Amen. Verse 29. For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate. He had a destination ready for you. You're going to end up here. Where? He predestinated us what? To be conformed to the image of His Son. Amen. God knows what you need to make you more like Jesus. Amen. He knows what you need. He knows what you need to have those rewards in heaven. He knows what you need. Over whom He did predestinate them, He also called. Whom He called them, He also justified. Whom He justified them, He also glorified. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, and He is, He is. He's for us. Who can be against us? He that spared not His own Son, God, do you care? He said, well, look at the cross. Right. Look at the cross. He that spared not His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? Amen. The Holy Spirit of God is in us as a comforter. Amen. He's in us praying for the perfect will of God in our lives. He's there to comfort us. He's there to get us through suffering and troubles and trials.
Hi everybody, this is Tim DeVries, pastor of Vision Valley Baptist Church in Mount Washington, Kentucky, and I want to thank you for watching our YouTube channel today. Our desire is that the world know Jesus Christ as Savior, and that in this generation, His people will be faithful, uh, courageous, bold witnesses for Him. I want to say to you, if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, God loves you and wants you to know for sure that you have a home in heaven. In order to know for sure you're saved and that you're going to heaven, the Bible tells us we need to know, first of all, that we're all sinners. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Because of our sin, we don't measure up to God's glory. God is perfect. We are not. And sin keeps us out of heaven. Secondly, the Bible says, For the wages of sin is death. The Scripture says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Revelation 20, 14 and 15 says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. You're going to spend eternity somewhere. And because of our sin, we don't deserve heaven. Unfortunately, we deserve a devil's hell. But the good news is this, that God loves us. And because He loves us, He made one way of salvation. It's not through a church. It's not through a religion. It's not through doing the best works you can do. The only way He made to get to heaven is through His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by Me. And in Acts 4.12, the Scripture says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus came to this earth. He was born. He lived a perfect, sinless life. The Bible says in Romans 5.8, But God commendeth His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus took our place on the old rugged cross. He was crucified, buried, and rose again to pay for our sins. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus today offers you a free gift. That gift is eternal life, heaven instead of hell. And if today you're willing to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, if you're willing to call on Him today to save you, the Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Romans 10.13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you call on the Lord Jesus Christ right now to be your Savior? If you will, He promised He would save you. Feel free to contact us with any questions. We want to help you grow in your walk with Jesus Christ. God bless you.